Authentication is commonly used to establish an identity online. Now, the problem with that is that authentication using the username and password means that if somebody else finds out that thing about me, that password, that their site is relying on to identify me uniquely, they can impersonate me and they can do things that I don't want them to do. As we've started to do so much more online, this bec has become a huge problem. So for example, imagine what somebody could do if they could log into his Facebook. Imagine what someone could do if they could log into your Gmail account. Imagine what someone could do if they could log into your Amazon.com account. Now, all these sites have a variety of different countermeasures to try to prevent this, but a lot of the troubles that we have with various types of authentication systems online are really based on this idea of a password. The problem with passwords is pretty simple. The, you know, typically, the more complicated a password gets, the harder it becomes for people to remember. Strong passwords are difficult for people to remember, and so people do dumb things with their strong passwords. Um, they write them down on their computer monitor where anybody can see them, um, or they don't pick very strong passwords, in which case they're easy to guess. So I can require that people use strong passwords, in which case I probably can go to their computer and write them all down in a minute, or I can let people use weak passwords that are easy to crack. So there's a lot of sort of interesting research and a lot of development in this area of how do we do authentication better. And in a lot of cases, what that means is bringing in other components of the system. So a novel way of doing authentication that started to take hold maybe over the past 10 years is something called two-factor authentication. And a lot of websites today allow you to enable this if you have security concerns and you're worried about making sure that your username and password haven't been compromised. So how does two-factor authentication work? So typical password authentication relies on something you know, um, and that is the password. The problem is passwords, again, I can, if I can somehow steal your password, I can use that password wherever. So two-factor authentication combines password control with something else. And frequently that something else is something you have. Um, frequently that can be a smartphone for certain two-factor authentication systems. A lot of companies now have a smart device that their employees actually carry with them. And in order to log in, you have to enter a username and password, at which point a code is sent to that special device. You then enter the code into a separate form, and then you are granted access to whatever you're trying to do. So how would that work? I would go to a particular website, and again, you can turn this on for services like Gmail, and, and we'll make the, the authentication process quite a bit stronger. So you go to Gmail, you enter your password, then Gmail would send a special access code to my device. I would uh, use the device to see the access code, enter it into the computer, and then I would be able to authenticate and complete the process. So why is this more secure? Well, it's more secure because it's relying on two things. One thing is something I know, and the other thing is something I have. To compromise this system, what does an attacker have to do? Well, an attacker normally would be able, maybe they're trying to guess my password, or they're, you know, they may try to uh, gain access to my computer to recover my passwords or something like that. But even if an attacker cracks my password, um, they don't necessarily have access to this device. This is also nice because there are two parts of the system that, that, uh, that I can monitor. If someone steals my password, it's really impossible for me to know until they do something that alerts me to it. So by the time I find out that they've stolen my password or my credit card number or something, they've purchased a bunch of stuff online, and then I have to deal with the mess. If I don't notice this phone, if I can't find my phone for a few hours, I notice very quickly. Um, and so relying on something that people have is typically a good strategy. Now this doesn't always work out perfectly, um, and there are some funny stories about reliance on this type of system. So for example, the President of the United States has a uh, complicated process, we would hope, a fail-safe process by which they are able to begin to access the country's nuclear arsenal. So let's say we're under some sort of terrible attack, there's a process that the President goes through to authenticate themselves so that they can launch nuclear weapons. And again, we would hope that that process is pretty secure, making sure that the person who is authenticating is actually the president and has the authority to launch missiles or to do that type of thing. Unfortunately, so apparently presidents are given this little um, piece of uh, a card that has some information on it that they're supposed to use during this process. So, you know, there's somebody nearby that has something that's known as the nuclear football, which is like a big suitcase with all of the plans of how we're going to strike different countries or whatever. And that's part of the process. But the other part of the process is this card that's known as the biscuit, apparently. 
The problem is, uh, certain presidents have lost the biscuit for weeks at a time. So there were weeks where if we had been attacked, and thank God we haven't been attacked, and we've never you know, been attacked in that way, and we haven't used nuclear weapons for a long time, uh, go world, but had we been attacked, uh, the president would have been fumbling around looking for this stupid little piece of paper so that they could respond. And so obviously, even at that level, even when it's that important, there are still problems with humans using these systems.